So welcome everyone um, to today's artist talk with Samitha Camasetti and Carlos Torres Machado. Um, this is the last in our series of talks for F11 Digital Paintings for Full Screen. Um, I'm Emily O'Leary, the Associate Curator at the Durfner Judaica Museum who mounted this online exhibition. Um, just to describe what the show originally was conceptualized as, um, F11 in the title refers to the function key that opens full screen viewing in internet browsers. In the COVID era, when art spaces were closed or at limited capacity, online exhibitions became ubiquitous, but often showcased works that exist as objects in the real world. F11 inverted this practice. It features digital paintings best viewed on screen. So today we have two of the artists in the exhibition who are going to discuss their work in the show as well as their artistic practice and what they're working on. Um, so I'll go in alphabetical order. Um, so we'll start with Samitha. Um, I'll just give your quick bio. So Samitha Kamasetti was born in Portland and raised in Bangalore where she is currently based. She graduated from New York University, in New York City, with a BFA in studio art in 2019. Her work focuses on how mundane domestic spaces and the objects within them can be emotionally transformative and carry spiritual and symbolic meaning. She works in drawing, textile, dyeing, photo, and digital-based media. So thank you so much for joining us today, Samhita, and I will... Go ahead and let you take it away. Hi. Well, it's nice to see all of you again, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to share my practice with all of you. Um, so in this presentation, I kind of wanted to focus on some of my older work that I did in school and what kind of led into my process and practice today. So I'll guess I'll share my... Oh, I forgot to do that. Um, okay. Oops, I'm gonna have to go back to the beginning. Sorry about that. There you go. I'm gonna switch off my video as I think it might lag. Okay. Okay, so I, when I make my work, I think the way I make is always changing. And I think I'm always trying to redefine my identity and the relationship to the culture that I've inherited. I think um, it's useful to pin words that describe my practice and it's always useful for me to reevaluate underlying themes that I constantly try to embody. Um, so these are some words that, I'm, that, that always come up like care, ritual, intimacy, memory, and circularity. I won't go into much detail, but I think it'll make more sense as I introduce my work. So these are a few drawings that I made in collaboration with a friend. Um, she sent me prompts and I made a series of drawings in response. And I've always been really inspired by observing my environment and really recording and selecting moments to draw. And I also kind of see this as a way of rejecting Eurocentric ways and principles of making and use that as a guide to really weave intricate elements together with layers and depth. And I've just always been drawn to like outsider art, decorative folk art, and using that as a way to build some of my drawing based work. And again, I had a very strong printmaking background, especially in school. And I think my prints were a way to build on my drawing work, but it was also an additive process that really focuses on the surface and allows 
time and space to really collapse onto a single metal, sorry, copper sheet. And I kind of see it in, as an extension of my drawing work, but it also helps me to kind of build an atmosphere with a very flat um, and uh, two-dimensional space. And these are a few more examples of my work kind of exploring texture, layers, and um, these are just exploratory prints um, using different etching techniques. And again, I guess I should mention that I really am careful about materiality and try to be as intentional as possible with mediums, method, and approach. Um, and kind of like reduce my environmental impact as much as possible. And so these were made at a paper making studio that I interned at in Brooklyn. And I was using some of their leftover pulp and materials that were left over from like workshops. And I guess I'm just drawn to materials that are accessible, but unconventional to a certain extent, but also that resonate deeply with me especially with emotions and feeling and all of that. And again, my cyanotypes are very much um, kind of demonstrate, though it's not a huge part of my practice. I think I love like having the chance to really explore materials and combine like hybrid methods of working. So, so this is like some of my photos with painterly gestures with the cyanotype solution that I made at a residency. And again, this is a similar one that I was kind of experimenting with different opacities like plastic and um, acetate and kind of cutting up shapes and gliding them over the sheets while it was exposed under the sun. And again, with my multidisciplinary practice, I also did a lot of ceramic based work and it kind of also builds on this idea of layering and texture, which I'm always very mesmerized with. And I guess when I talked about language, I, I think it's always important for me to pin down a word when I make work. So for example, this book, I was like, I wanna make a book. So I just made five slabs and put four holes and kind of stitched it together with with rope, but this is how it looks deassembled, I guess. Um, and it's also important to really um, be disruptive with the materials that I use. I think being traditional is something that I kind of shy away from and rebel because I think it's important to like kind of experiment, but also make a statement in some way. Um, and so this is also a tea set that I made. I was really fascinated by the idea of like, especially in my culture, um, women coming together during tea time and making things. Um, it's also kind of to make visible the invisible labor of women's work and kind of holding, holding down some of the, the heritage um, and domestic environments that are held within. And I guess now, I hope I'm okay with time. Um, I wanted to show you some of the photos that I've been taking. I came back to India, I think I don't think I mentioned it, but I think Emily mentioned it. I came back to India during the pandemic and it was a very um, cathartic journey for me. I was kind of surrounded by an explosion of color, which is something that I was kind of shying away from earlier. And I guess being in a quiet place and being surrounded in nature was kind of indispensable to me and my mental well being, and kind of letting go of some of the rigidness and the rigor of my life in the States. Um, so these are some of the pictures that I took. Um, and kind of using these as a framework for um, my drawing work, which I will show you next. Mm. 
Oops. And these are a few more pictures. And I guess this is the series that I have on at in this exhibition. I, I, like I said, it was a very healing process for me to kind of work with color again, as you saw, I kind of worked with a very limited palette and kind of using color and texture and patterns again was a relief to be honest, because I really enjoyed working with these, um, keeping color in mind. I, I think having this working from a mindset of abundance kind of shifted the way I approach my work right now and kind of finding the comfort and warmth in the loneliness of the pandemic. And, and as much as we, I mean, we all, we all have our own respective experiences, but I, I think we all needed to find moments of joy in our everyday lives. And this was um, a very cathartic experience for me by kind of using not using uh, a digital practice, but also kind of finding a style and a composition that really worked for me and wasn't much of a burden, um, especially in this time. And this is also um, an observational study, which I kind of put together and collaged on Photoshop and it was supposed to be some kind of scroll, but it's still a work in progress, I guess. Um, and this is a series that I'm working on at the moment. I have been really fascinated by quilts recently. And I think it's because it's a very community driven practice. And I find that quilts are like record keepers, just like books. And it's kind of this idea of exploring my environment, but also exploring quilt patterns and kind of finding a language that, that embodies this sense of intimacy and care and comfort. And this is also uh, an extension of that same series that I did for like a fundraiser. And it's kind of like about new roots. It's called new roots. Um, I guess it's really about rebuilding and growth. And really, the, the future always seems uncertain, but uh, things will bloom and flowers will bloom and things will grow and things will kind of move on at their own pace. Um, so this is a kind of what a summary of some of my work and how it's kind of led into something less tangible, but I really hope that I'm able to really use my digital methods and make something that I can hold like a book or a scroll. And I'm really excited to see how my work develops in the future. Um, thank you. And let me know if you have any questions as well. Oops, thank you. <laughs> I think I'm on. Can you hear me? I think it's lagging. There we go, yes, I believe. Okay, perfect. Perfect, okay. So next, um, let me just adjust this view. Here, okay. So I will introduce Carlos. Um, also, I just wanted to let everyone know we will have time at the end for Q&A. So you can... Yeah. You, you can type your um, questions into the chat or at the end, you can also just chime in um, once we're finished with the presentation. So 
So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Carlos. So Carlos Torres Machado received his BA in Contemporary Arts and Communication with minors in Photography and Psychology from the Universidad de las Artes in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Universidad San Francisco in Quito, Ecuador. He is the recipient of the New York Regional Award of the Bombay Sapphire Artisan Series in 2017 and a grant from NIFA and Foundation for Contemporary Arts to support his practice through the pandemic. He has completed residencies in Brooklyn at the Bushwick Generator in 2019 and Trestle Art Space in 2016. He is the director of Arte Let M, an arts organization dedicated to the support of Latinx visual artists. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Carlos, and please feel free to take it away. <laughs> thank you very much, Emily. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be part of, of this exhibition. Uh, I am very glad to, to you know, to, that I was selected, it was very exciting for me because it aligns with what happened with me in, in this uh, evolution, in this mutation of going from uh, artworks that I was doing, uh, big installations, a painting, uh, you know, uh, on the wall uh, to moving uh, because of the COVID and uh, because we were, we were forced to be home uh, to start developing these digital paintings. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing with you. Uh, basically, I'm going to share my website where all my data centers are uh, for people to, to start uh, understanding a little bit better uh, what's my project about. Uh, so the data centers started uh, in 2015. Uh, I had, I realized that I wanted to create something, you know, big. Uh, it was a challenge here in New York uh, to find uh, this, you know, a, a place for these big installations that I was creating. I'm going to start from the bottom here. Um, so what I did is I start, I start painting panels uh, and then I start putting it together in the studio. I was lucky to have a studio that have a big wall. Um, but I started to run out of space uh, while I was, you know, combining the pollens, working in the process of these data centers. So uh, I started to go to the corners. And I think that was a, a, a huge change in this conversation because uh, it has a lot of acceptance. Uh, it was a much strong dialogue with the viewer. Uh, the viewer felt like the data centers hug, the artwork hug them they could go inside the corner and outside. So uh, everything started to took form. So I started to go also to the floor and use the wall. Uh, in this piece, for example, in the data center 17, I used the ceiling and the, and the wall. So it was, a it was great. I was starting to have fun. My work was starting to be in, in exhibitions, in galleries. Uh, an art fairs, I traveled to Miami, I won an award, and then COVID happened. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a bit hard to understand that I have to, how, how to move this project uh, to a different, totally different field, and not and, and, and a field that I, I, I didn't explore before. Um, so I just, you know, when you don't have options, you just have to go ahead and do it. Uh, and I start to develop it. Uh, here is one of the of the data centers that are showing right now in the in the Devner Museum. Museum. Uh, and I started to you know play around based on the same concept that I had of the data centers. And I started to to play with uh, perspective, uh, with color. Uh, I started to move uh, the pieces. 3D. Uh, so I realized that I have a lot of uh, more uh, freedom to play around these uh, artworks. Uh, and when I started to put uh, one next to the other, like one artwork, one installation and one digital artwork, everything started to make sense to me. Um, it was, for example, in this series, 
in the one in the middle is the one that is digital that you almost can see the difference and that's why i like of this play uh, of this game about moving from digital the that process that i was doing you know for in-person shows uh, and all that um, the other thing that surprised me a lot is that when i finished some of the data centers uh, the digital paintings I started to put it out there. I had a, that philosophy that I learned from, from a curator that guided me in the past. And I, when you finish a process, start putting it out there so you will get feedback and you start growing as an artist. And from, you know, from the beginning, it has a lot of attention. It had a lot of acceptance. I went to and, and do, did an exhibitions in, in, in Korea. A, 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 you know, a totally different continent that I was, you know, dreaming to show at, uh, at some point in my life. And due to this ability now that have virtual exhibitions, that the persons can print the digital paintings and put it in shows. So I started to found that this is something that, okay, it was, it is bad. It, it happens because it came from a, from a circumstance, a very hard circumstance for humanity, but uh, it has a lot of doors that started to open and then came this exhibition. Uh, so, I felt very, very rewarded uh, with the process, even though that when I started, it was uh, really hard to move to digital paintings. Uh, now I am developing a digital book with this process that is going to be an interactive book that the pieces can, are going to come together in the book. It's not just going to be the flat space. People could interact creating the pieces. So a lot of things are happening, not only for me, but for the arts that I see that there are, you know, a, a, a new exploration for artists and as well uh, for museums, for uh, organizations, for cultural centers to open the doors for these projects like, like the one that, that we have right now, which is amazing. I had a lot of good feedback for the people that uh, uh, have been visiting the, the exhibition, the F11. The title is, you know, is, I think that is very accordance of what's going on right now. Uh, so yeah, I invite you to, to go, the viewers, I invite you to go to the, to the website uh, to see all the data centers, go and click one by one. You can see it in more detail um, to feel what uh, this experience, this is the big, the biggest data centers that I created um, in a process that I was working with the stripes. And then I moved to color fields only. Um, yeah, and then also I, I've been developing all other other series, other process, as you can see in the back. I'm playing now around with, again, with this kind of strides, but moving it in different tonalities. And I'm working also uh, these projects now, every project that I develop, I'm working, in, you know, in canvas, on painting on canvas, the sculpture, but also digital at the same time. So it's been a, a, a very rewarding experience, this process now in this last year and a half. Uh, and I, I, for me, it's like, you know, we as artists need to constantly uh, reinvent ourselves. Uh, so I think that this circumstance which just, that just happened put us in this process that we have to come out with new things adapt so to what's coming uh, for the arts and um, kind of have the approach that we have before in front of the canvas having it now in front of the computer so i don't want to extend too much with my talk I, I i always like better to have the approach from people questions uh, and take it from there to to answer uh, you know anything that you that the you know the person that are here that i thank you very much for all that made it today uh, so if you have any questions please let me know i'll be happy to to talk about it thank you so much carlos um Going to go back to gallery view so we can see. So, if anyone has any questions for the artist, we would love to field those. So, please feel free to either type it into the chat or jump right in and unmute yourself to share.
Let's see. Make sure. Well, I actually do have a question. Um, I know Carlos had already covered the transition from making physical work to making digital work. Um, but I also wanted to ask Samitha the same question about when did you first start to incorporate or utilize digital processes into your work? Because I know you do sort of a hybrid of different approaches and everything. Right. So I think it kind of started with my printmaking background because I was doing a lot of screen printing as well. So I would kind of manipulate images that I'd taken and kind of print it on acetate and experiment with that. But I wasn't kind of using it as a, as a I wasn't using it as a, as a tool necessarily in my work. I, I think it's only been since the pandemic that I was like, okay, I can actually use this as a way of like rearranging objects, but otherwise it wasn't fully um, a fleshed out tool that I was using. Does anyone else, would anyone else like to ask about the show or the digital art process? Well, one question I posed in the last um, talk was thoughts about this current craze with NFTs and <laughs> um, selling digital assets, essentially artwork or anything else using NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens based on something called blockchain code for anybody who isn't familiar with this technology and it's sort of become the latest craze in the digital art world. Um, so I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on the potential of that, the drawbacks, your opinion, if you plan to participate in that uh, phenomenon <laughs> right now. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I've just been learning about NFTs, actually. I took like a little workshop recently. Um, I just, I'm, I think the most thing I'm worried about is the environmental impact and like the gas fees and kind of putting that into consideration. But I think it's like a really amazing way to really profit off your like creativity, especially for like um, designers or artists or um, I, my knowledge is very limited, but I, I'm willing to explore it to a certain extent to see the potential of that space. Yeah. Yeah, well, well I think that that's something that is coming as, uh, as the same way that virtual exhibitions start to appearing like a couple of years ago, even before COVID. What happened with COVID is that it just became stronger. Um, I think that the currency of how we are gonna move the artworks is going in the same way. And artists and also the uh, institutions, uh, we are in a process of adaptation of, as, as uh, some Hita say, of process of learning. Some are, you know, are more into it, especially the youngest one, uh, or other ones are being familiar from years ago and now they are being successful. They are successful because of this phenomenon. Uh, artists that wasn't in the, you know, in the radar, now they've been, you know, working before, even before on digital paintings, on putting out there, selling on through, through this type of currency. And now they are the ones that are on the ahead of everyone else. Uh, but I think that it's something that sooner or later is going to be a, 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 a part of our daily, daily lives. Um, and I think it's interesting. I mean, everything in life has good and bad sides. And this type of Currency is, is also the same, it's not the exception. But I try to stay positive in the good size that these have. A lot of artists are gonna be able to sell their works much easily directly to collectors. So the same way when social media appears, our, that was like kind of our marketing tool to put our works out there without having to hire any you know, marketing agency. 
So I think that now is something kind of like that. Instead of having to wait until we get into an auction or things like that, artists now can take the first step and do it by, by themselves. The only challenge here is time for artists because, you know, we love to stay in our studio to do artworks, to produce artworks. So finding the time to, you know, learn all these and adapt to all these is gonna, you know, is a challenge, at least for me. Uh, but this is a process that I have in my mind that I have to do it. And, uh, you know, with other artists, but when we talk, it's, it's like we are moving, all of us, we, the, all the ones that we, I'm talking with are moving in the same way. Um, and on a slightly different note, more more to the point of the content and style of your work, I see you both really utilize color and colors and saturated colors or color juxtapositions as being essential elements to the work. And I know that, Carlos, you had a very interesting and complex description of your data centers and how it was this rearrangement of information using color. So if you both would like to touch on how color is important in your work um, and maybe also some of the tools that you, digital tools that you've used to create these compositions and, you know, apply different color effects or different, you know, things like that. So I would, I would love to hear from both of you, your thoughts on that. Yeah, so basically, I treat color, when I started this project, my goal was to treat color as information, as a tool of information. Color is being, a, is being something that I love to work with. Uh, with the years, I've been, you know, learning a lot from other artists that I love, from, you know, artists from the past. I came, I, I'm, I come from a background of a mother painter. Uh, so for me, color was something that started at a very early age. And I always felt that I had that, in, with color, I had that freedom to play around and move uh, without any, 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 without being shy, without being uh, afraid of anything. So for me, it's been like a, a, a great tool, a great channel to explore art. And, um, and now that I'm in the digital painting, luckily uh, I had in college a good teachers in Photoshop. So I, I have a very strong knowledge in Photoshop. So when I move, I move directly to, to Photoshop to do digital paintings. And I haven't had any problem to work with color. Actually, it's, ironically, it's easily because you have you know, tools that can make you change the color that you don't like just like that. In, 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 when I was playing with the data centers, building the installations, I had to play the, uh, with colors. And if I, I needed a new color, I have to go and paint a new panel and then put it in. So the process was very slow. Now it's really, really fast. And uh, you can build, you know, make mistakes. You come next day, you delete that mistake, you put the new panel. So there's a new kind of freedom for me in doing these artworks. Uh, but now the challenge is, for example, what I'm gonna do with these artworks. What I, I, I wanna keep it digital, never printed. I wanna print it and show it like frame. So those are questions that I am, you know, having right now is like, because for me it's like, if it's a digital painting, it should live in a digital environment, right? But then it's like, what about if a collector says, hey, I want that, this in my wall? What should I do? Should I go against that belief that I have? So those are the questions that artists will have to little by little start answering ourselves and, you know, go with a philosophy that we want to follow, like on, as, a, as a main subject. Um, I guess for me, um, as you saw with my previous work, color was very considered and I followed a very limited palette, not out of um, necessity, but I think it kind of describes the environment that you're surrounded by, especially when you're in school, you're really influenced by the work your, your peers are making and kind of the language that's generated during the course and kind of like the materials are accessible to you. 
but I think um, I kind of view colors as a way of telling a story, um, especially since I've been in India and being surrounded with an explosion of color. Um, it's really been a useful way of um, kind of mapping out um, seasons and narratives and kind of weaving um, an atmosphere, um, which I never, um, which is something that was um, something I tried to shy away from earlier. Um, and I think um, it's kind of allowed me to be more bolder visually. Um, I think I was kind of afraid of using or wielding color because I thought it would be too much or I think the whole the the language kind of shifts when when people see a lot of color and that's what I like kind of experienced through earlier critiques so I kind of always try to tone it down but I think this pandemic has been a kind of like a wake-up call to really like put it out all there because it it really doesn't make much of a difference um, but as for digital methods I am self-taught uh, I've been learning for the past like maybe six years. I've kind of just um, been using them um, and experimenting and exploring um, with different uh, tools that kind of suit my work. Um, I kind of try to be as minimal as possible because I kind of want to maintain um, the traditional aspects of working and not, um, not it be com completely overrided by like pixels or um, um, any digital tools, but I tried to maintain um, the the energy that I had when I drew them physically. Yeah. I do see we have a question um, from Rima. She asks, I was actually wondering about working with color and how the digital process differs from the analog one. Um, well, what it uh, for from for me, what it uh, differs is that uh, when I do my artworks, uh, my when I paint my panels, I am I feel, uh, and maybe just, this, that's just my sensation. I feel that I'm in control of the color tonality that I want to use uh, because I put a little more of orange, a little more of that. So when I feel that I have the color I want. It's like I have that feeling that that's that's what I'm looking for. In, in digital, it's a little bit different the procedure because you have to move, but at, at the same time you are on a you know you, you have to the the your computer it has to be you know you have to calibrate you, the screen of your computer to have the most accurate true color because if not, probably you are satisfied with the color that you are looking, but in another screen is a different tonality. So those are kind of things that, you know, sometimes put me like in doubts, like how is gonna look that color. Sometimes I, you know, I do a, a, a screenshot and I go and send it to my phone to see how it looks in the phone. I see it on another screen. So uh, as, as I mentioned before, it's a process that we are learning, but for I, right now, I will say that, uh, I feel that I don't have entire control of the tonality that I want. So it's something that we will have to, you know, uh, keep learning in the process and adapting and finding new tools that will give us, uh, that at some point will give us that same feeling that we used to have when we mix the color, you know, in, in your studio in person. Yeah, I guess I agree with Carlos as well. It's also a process that we're currently always, you know, relearning, unlearning, learning. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have much to add um, on, but if they're both, they feel like very disparate processes, but at the same time, it's kind of like meeting, um, coming to a middle ground and seeing how, how color affects um, both um, mediums. Yes, actually it was interesting working with all the artists um, since everyone does such different work. And I 
myself as the curator did the same here where I asked my colleague right across from me at her desk, can you open this on your monitor and see what it looks like? And then I'd go to my phone and look at my phone and see what it looked like. And I think, you know, yes, it's true. There's always going to be that variation. It can be difficult to control when it's on screen. Um, and with this virtual exhibition, it's actually the first virtual exhibition the Durfner has ever done. Um, and the reason being COVID, but what's been interesting, like Carlos said, at the same time, it's opened up a lot of ways to reach a broader audience to come together. Um, you know, we have 10 artists in the show. We have Simitha in India right now. We have Carlos, you're in New York right now, right? New York City. Um, many different time zones. So that, you know, we've always been able to do that for artist talks, but now everyone's so attuned to things like Zoom that we really can bring that to the fore. So, um, but the idea of curating a website essentially was an interesting challenge and also how do you make it an art space so i'm also actually i'd be curious to know um if either of you have gotten feedback on the exhibition and people who went to see your work and visited the site and what their experience was like looking at your work on the screen and visiting a virtual exhibition you're in but it's on a website. I'd love to hear anything, any thoughts you have about that or anything you've received feedback wise. Um, well, I received a lot of good feedback uh, on the exhibition. It's very neat. It's, you know, the artworks are very solid uh, of all the artists. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, a person told me is that they were expecting to be on a, on a gallery, actually, in a 3D gallery. But we have to be used that when we are into a virtual exhibition, there are different ways to show uh, the artworks. Uh, one of the great things that we have in this exhibition is that we can get to see, you know, a little paragraph to have an idea of what's going on or what the process is about. Sometimes in the virtual galleries, it's just the artworks after artwork, and you don't get to understand much about the process of the artist. These are talks that also helps a lot to understand uh, what the process of each of us that are involved in this exhibition uh, is about. So I, for me, is a, is a, is a success, uh, but you know, every person have its point, its, its point of view. And it's also, as you mentioned, Emily, is a, is a first step for the museum, but it's a good step. That's how museums have to start doing. They have to start getting involved with this kind of what's going on in the arts right now, and not leave all what ha you know all the all the all the other shows in person and things like that because that's gonna come back, but stay also with this kind of of richness that the virtual exhibition have. As you mentioned, we are now talking with Samhita that is in India. We have artists from other countries, and that cultural from the from a cultural perspective is is amazing. It's great. Yeah, I have to agree with him as well. Um, it's amazing that we could reach as many people uh, around the world. And I guess regarding the F11, the website, I think it's like very accessible and it's very easy to navigate. And I think when you introduce too many things at once, it's always difficult to understand because these things are kind of dynamic. Um, so I think it's always good to distill it into a, a simple platform first before like kind of developing it further. Um, I know a lot of people that viewed it on their phones and that was amazing because you could still kind of like scroll and a lot of people, you know, don't want to open their desktops and hit F11, but, <laughs> um, but it's still, it was still a very immersive um, experience, even if people were using their mobiles to, to view the space. Yeah, thank you so much for your thoughts on that. It, it was a interesting curatorial experience. I built the website, so I was the one that actually tried to approach it um, 
I'm familiar with, I write about it in the catalog, but the virtual three-dimensional galleries, and there's many different platforms, and of course more have sprung up since COVID, um, with their their flaws and their pros. It's It's interesting, and I think part of the reason I wanted to just stick with that, and yes, it was absolutely meant to be mobile accessible, even though the idea was F11, and that was a little bit of the, you know, gimmicky part of it, a little hook. Um, it was absolutely just meant to be able to be a beautiful image that you could view on a screen that was optimally viewed on a screen. Um, and the whole process itself, um, we put out an open call. So you both responded to the open call, um, and that's how you became involved in the exhibition. We had I think 140 respondents and the range of where people you know submitted from was remarkable and you know I was thinking about that and I've I've been curating I've been at the museum 15 years I've curated many many shows and I was thinking well there's no way that I'd be able to curate a show with you know Lu Luis Arrow in Brazil and in a physical space, right? Or it'd be very expensive, <laughs> Luis in Brazil, and then Carlos in New York, and then Samitha in India, and all of the other artists are somewhere in California. Um, and yet we're able to do it on this website with work that is digital. And that is the best way to view it is on the screen. So that's interesting. Yeah, I was trying, we were just thinking about, well, should the museum branch out into this three-dimensional space that you're navigating, um, that in and of itself, I feel, could be a new media project. How do we experience an art space? Um, I actually have found, I don't know about, maybe you could speak to this a little bit, going into these three-dimensional galleries and the different types that there are, I actually find them very uncanny at times because there'll be like a wall and you turn toward the wall and it's just empty blank space. <laughs> it's supposed to sort of replicate that gallery going experience and essentially it's a rendered environment. It's almost like a video game, the way it, somebody would approach a rendered environment. Um, and some of them sort of reminded me of playing Doom, right, in the early <laughs> 90s, the way it was set up. So I just found that in and of itself, the experience of art looking and visiting what you consider an art space and the interaction with that to be interesting in and of itself. So from a curatorial perspective, those are my thoughts, but from an art artist perspective, what are your thoughts about having your work exhibited in these different platforms now, whether physically or three-dimensionally or on a website? I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on what's going on with that right now. Well, um, one of the one of the things that is sometimes is a bit difficult in these virtual galleries is that not everybody is used to navigate it. So for some people, sometimes it becomes a little hard to move around the gallery from one piece to the other one. And you know, if they don't if they don't feel comfortable uh, in the gallery, they they just click. Uh, you know, they just left, they just leave. So that's a something that uh, I think that we're in a process. I think that virtual reality so, is something that's going to come and help in that sense to have a more uh, vivid experience of a virtual exhibition of a virtual show because it's going to be much easier that you walk, actually walk, and you are walking in the, in the gallery. It's going to be much easier. So I think that we are in a process somehow. Uh, but it's something that is, it, it's, you know, it's very popular right now. I had shows in both, in, 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 exhibition, in virtual exhibitions that are like uh, the ones that we have right now in F11 and in the, in the other one. Uh, and both have, uh, as, as I told you, good sides and, and, and other sides that people try to understand. Uh, the, but it's something that, that we all are in this process uh, of understanding these platforms. Uh, the artists and also the viewers.
Um, yeah, I agree with that. It's also it, it's nice to have uh, a place to put your work that doesn't that isn't um, especially the the, the non tangible aspects at least, um, which is which is a kind of nice way um, to exhibit in COVID. Um, yeah, I agree. It does take um, it is a lot of learning and adjusting. Um, I also participated in. Um, another online exhibition, which was more of like a game. And I guess some of the drawbacks of that is that you have to download it and it takes like 256 MB or it takes a lot of disk space and a lot of people aren't open to doing that. <laughs> um, so it, it really is up to how um, much people want to um, insert themselves in that space and um, take the time to really explore uh, it's definitely a very exciting time, but I'm, I'm really not sure how. It it, it feels very elastic, um, since more in person things are kind of opening up. So I'm excited to see how it will, how virtual spaces will develop, or if they will just be like staggered over the next um, couple of years. I don't know. I'm, I'm really unsure how um, it's going to look like, but it's exciting to see. Well, I'll just ask again, since we have about seven minutes left, if anybody in the session would like to pose a question or a comment. We have a very quiet audience today. <laughs> I'd just like to uh, reflect a bit. Uh, um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, both of the artists, in fact, all of the artists in, in the show have uh, spoken about is, is really how they've used um, locked on in in a positive way that that you know, although COVID has been a monumentally dreadful event in everybody's life, uh, it's also brought uh, uh, has been a positive element uh, for the artist in that it's brought a variety of different aspects for for the artist. And I would just wondered if I could ask the artists to reflect on what those positive elements were for them. Or not. So it's about the positive the positive elements of the of having these exhibitions. I just want to be clear of the on the on the question, Donna. Yeah. Um I, I suppose it was is I mean, one of, for me at least, the the positive the elements, for example, was uh, just having time uh, to to see the world a bit more clearly because I'm spending t my life has slowed down significantly. I'm getting time to walk the park and become mindful in my practice in a much more daily way, and and as a result of that, become creative again. Um, so, but it. it everybody's experience is different. Yes, well, in my case, uh, ironically, it was the opposite because as so COVID hit us, I have to found, found, find new ways to make an income to for my family. So actually I had to rush uh, much faster than, than how I, it was before. Uh, and in that process, I was doing the digital painting. So I was like, I was saying like, I'm home, but I'm so full. Uh, even more that, you know, that when you go, you know, when you used to wake, wake, up, wake up and go home, go work. And when you go arrive from work, you are at home and you have your time and ta da da. Now I was at home and I was working a lot, you know, because we were on a, on a pandemic, on a never seen circumstances, at least for, for most of the population. So, but it was, uh, you know, now that I, I'm starting to sing from being a little bit out because in New York, the process is, is, going, is going well with the pandemic. Um, a, a lot of things are, are getting activated again, a lot of exhibitions and things like that. Uh, so now that I, we have these two elements, the in-person exhibitions, the virtual exhibitions, I just went to an exhibition of virtual reality that have in, an in-person. So, is, I see that the, the, this, even though it was really hard, it gave the art a lot of much uh, more, uh, more things for people, for the audience to interact. 
I think that now that I see it just going for an exhibition before, I see it a little boring right now. Now the, the artists have to come out with new ways to show their work, to be, you know, upfront, to call the attention of the, of the viewers. Uh, so I think that for, uh, that's the great part of this kind of processes because for Donald, uh, both, we both are artists, for Donald, uh, it happened in a way, for me, it happened in another way, maybe for some heat that happened in a totally different way. Yeah, definitely. Um, I empathize with that. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't want to romanticize the pandemic, but at the same time, I feel deeply privileged that I was able to, you know, be, um, be, be at home with my, my family and have most of my needs being taken care of, that I was able to kind of concentrate on my work and also, also um, building my practice in a different um, way. It definitely, um, there were a very, there was, it was not an easy experience. I definitely, we experienced a lot of grief, but at the same time, I think it allowed me to really slow down and really, um, gravitate to materials that um, gave me a sense of warmth and care and um, really think about how I can um, work um, with very limited materials but also find joy in everyday life. Yeah. Well, thank you so Oh, Donald, did you want to say something? No, I just wanted to say thank you. That was all. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think that's a great note to end on since we've reached one o'clock. So I just want to thank everyone who came and participated and especially thank you to the artists for being here and providing this talk. Um, 